anytime we have a conversation in America about inequality and we're serious about looking at the history of it and the roots of it, this is racial reckoning. You know, when you look at the data from the 60s, uh, you know, African Americans were among the healthiest groups of the population. <laughs> in fact, far healthier than whites. And now it's the opposite. Uh, and and you think this sort of effort among the fast food companies and not just fast food, but also big food companies targeting uh, minority populations, African Americans, Hispanics, is to blame for that? Well, I think it's I think it's multi layered. I mean, the first thing I would say is that one thing that I really kind of you know push back on a little bit is you know when we when we talk about African American food cultures prior to the immersion of fast food in black communities, we always mm. have the problem of nutrition. So African-Americans yeah. may have had lower body weight. Um, there was a moment where yeah. the life expectancy um, differentials between whites and blacks were slowly closing, but mm. the access to good quality and Food, yeah. foods that were highly nutritious, that were varied, had always been a challenge. Whether a person was a farmer in the Jim Crow South, and you know they're um, harvesting all sorts of agricultural goods, but their families mm. are subsisting on beans. To people yeah. in um, places like Chicago, New York City, where a lot of the activism was about the quality of food in the local grocery stores, and so all of this is to say that what we see is a tradition of. Um, not being able to access the foods that people need, a tradition mm. of not being able to get the health care people need, a tradition mm. of joblessness, and they're all compounding, you know, one on top of the, the other. And then there's this thing called fast food that is mm. providing a job, even if it's incredibly low wage, that does yeah. provide the opportunity to eat food, even though it isn't nutritious and well-rounded, and is yeah. also, you know, becoming part of the larger culture of the of the of the community. Yeah, on any given day, about a third of Americans eat at fast food restaurants, uh, and and yet fast food is, isn't really the same in terms of its meaning and its place in our culture among different parts of our society. For example, uh, in suburban areas versus. Uh, you know, lower socioeconomic areas. And for some, you know, owning a franchise can be a, a pathway to wealth. And it's been that in in part um, through some very focused efforts of the food industry to bring African-Americans and others into ownership around fast food franchise as a path to wealth. But it also is a source of disease and, and suffering and, and a burden for many of these communities. And there's these fast food restaurants are hyper concentrated in segregated areas and low socioeconomic areas. And, and it's, it's part of why we see, for example, you know, African-Americans be far more likely to have diabetes, heart disease, obesity. And according to the CDC, Amer African-Americans eat uh, more fast food than any other group of the population. So the question is really, how did we get there? How did this happen? And, and, and tell us more about the history of how, how we ended up where we are, where we're seeing just this massive, massive concentration of fast food restaurants in places where, you know, people are struggling with their health and with poverty and, and with challenges. Well, one of the things that I discovered in my research is that there is a direct line between this transitional moment in the mid to late 1960s in America in terms of the fight for racial justice, the question of the role of the government in responding to people's lived realities, and the pivot in the civil rights movement with the rise of fast food. And so essentially what happens in the 1960s is that after there is a wave of very important legislation around the issue of schools, public accommodations, voting rights, there's this huge gap in terms of economic opportunity. And as we mm. saw in the George Floyd summer of 2020, throughout the 1960s, there were these uprisings and rebellions that people said, you know, why are people so um, distanced from the American dream? You know, what's happening? And one of the conclusions was that there weren't enough business opportunities. There were not enough, mm. um, you know, of an array of real retailers that were really responding to African-American markets. And that got interpreted as a growth opportunity for fast food. So after mm. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, months later, you have the opening of the first African-American franchised McDonald's. And that's not a coincidence. Mm -hmm. This was yeah. a moment in which big business was supposed to be the solution to the problem of racial justice. Mm. 
But but Ralph Abernathy, who was the head of the Southern uh, Christian Leadership Conference after Martin Luther King, said he didn't really believe in black capitalism. He believed in black socialism. And yet uh, he ended up in some ways being co-opted by receiving money from McDonald's. So can you talk about the challenges that this community faced and the idea that, you know, there was, there, there was benefit in the idea that there could be salvation in economic opportunity and creating entrepreneurship in the African-American community, but it kind of backfired in a way, right? Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's not designed to do that. Right. So, you know, I, I don't go to my local, you know, shoe store to try to, you know, see a doctor, right? It's not made Mm -hmm. for that. The shoe store is supposed to provide shoes. And I think in many ways, you know, the idea that business could solve these complex problems of housing, of education, of jobs, of healthcare. And so the weight that a lot of these early African-American franchise owners had to carry was enormous. Mm. And they were doing Mm. their best in the context of having businesses that were community serving, that were community facing, that were trying to respond to local needs, but also the bottom line. And I think that, you know, the fast food industry understood, I, I don't know if desperation is the right word, but they understood that the window of opportunity was incredibly narrow and very few people were going to pass through it. And through these businesses, they start co-opting and aligning themselves with this idea of civil rights as being delivered by big business. So so the notion was that in, you through improved economic opportunity and by empowerment of African-American entrepreneurs, that it would raise the boat for, for everyone. And, yeah, and, and yet, that didn't really happen. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I think it's, you know, this is a period in the late 60s, early 70s, that is, you know, the nation is being primed for the Reagan era of trickle down economics, um, you know, the glorification of the small business owner as being the job creator, you know, all of these mm. things that were still with us in many ways, when we talk mm. about the problem of poverty, and we talk about the role of business, that was kind of what was happening in I think it's most unobscured form. And so, mm. you know, people people believed and people wanted to see if it was possible. Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, you know, it's interesting when the first the first McDonald's uh, <laughs> were actually in suburban white neighborhoods and were serving sort of a more affluent white community. And and actually there was segregation in the Jim Crow South. The local populations that were African-American couldn't eat at McDonald's, right? Mm-hmm. They were sort of ex- excluded from there. And and how did that all shift? Was it was it because of this awareness that that there was a business opportunity to access a, a new market share from the fast food companies and they were sort of perniciously targeting them? Is that is that is that fair to say? I think that's fair to say. I think you've got a number of things happening. So in the Deep South, you have the student activists of groups like the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee and other civil rights organizations that are trying to dismantle segregation everywhere. So they're targeting McDonald's in places like Arkansas and Tennessee and North Carolina. And then, you know, after the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, businesses are now told you have to serve everybody. And Mm. there is a growing awareness of a growing affluent African-American community. So there's greater segmentation of markets and people are saying, okay, we can, we can pivot towards a new broader audience that can afford our goods that wants to celebrate access to these experiences in the marketplace that they didn't have before. And so Mm -hmm. it was just kind of coming together of the fact that so much about the civil rights movement was about Mm. the relationship of the consumer and consumer goods. So whether Mm. it's trying to end desegregation in uh, restaurants, whether it's trying to test the boundaries of integrated travel or, you know, ensuring that department stores would serve people on an equal basis. So much of it was about consumer power. And in the late sixties, people really, um, you know, they, they really, really honed in on that. And, and, and you think, you know, you talked about this sort of, sort of intersection of fast food companies, black capitalists and civil rights leaders who sort of thought that maybe opening up these opportunities would, would help racial inequality. Um, mm-hmm. But, but it kind of, it kind of sort of did that for a bunch of families, but not for everybody else. And it actually led to, in my view, a worsening 
of the plight of the African American community because it led to rampant obesity, diabetes, and chronic illness, and also, uh, you know, because of the, these areas were food deserts and there wasn't access to their food, it was sort of all, often the only place people could go, the only place that was safe, the only place that you know it was clean and it had maybe had now has services like Wi-Fi or where people could gather. So it provided a, a service to the community, but also has has created such devastation when i when i look at it from the outside as a doctor you know i'm thinking from a health lens what what happened when when we expanded the fast food industry when we expanded the 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 heavy marketing of industrial processed food to these communities it, it's it's really in in a sense it's a it's, it's a sense of food injustice or food racism or i don't know what the right term is but there's there's some phenomenon that's happened in this culture and and guys like kelly brownell and others uh, who was from the rudd center at yale and looked at food policy you know have really documented how the food industry has, has literally targeted these communities specifically uh to to increase their consumption of these foods and 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 has focused on for example african-american hispanic communities and the kids see way more ads for fast food way more ads for junk food if we're exposed to it, they're more likely to consume these foods in larger amounts. And, and the, you know, the, I mean, the, 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 I mean, you see these little kids with two, three, three or four years old with type two diabetes, which we used to call adult onset diabetes. <laughs> and now we're seeing in these communities at, at disproportionate rates. So I feel like there's been this sort of phenomenon that's sort of happened almost underneath the, the radar of people's awareness where this whole phenomenon of food injustice has, has, has been, going on and is accounting for so much of the challenges that I believe are facing these communities in terms of education and cognitive development. I mean, just developmentally, when you eat these foods, your brain isn't functioning. It's not developing. When you're obese, your life expectancy as a kid, if you're obese as a kid, it goes down 13 years. You're less likely to have a successful job and be economically viable. So there's so many layers to the problem. And, and the question is really, you know, how do we get, how do we kind of navigate this now? Because, you know, what, what started out as, as maybe a hopeful idea that by empowering these communities with businesses that it would help them, it's sort of done the opposite in my view. Well, I think that there, you know, there are a number of ways to look at this. I think the first one is that we have to get serious about the public sector responding to the needs of the public good. Businesses are not in any position to determine the fates of people. Um, and I think that all of the issues that you, you know, you touch upon, I think it's about quality of life. And so if someone says, well, what do we do? And I said, well, what if we have healthcare for all, free college, a living wage, and some type of paid family leave and childcare? And someone says, mm -hmm. well, what does that have to do with food? And I said, well, the expectation that people could live in a food system that is varied that is robust and productive, where's the time? Where's the money? Where's the ability mm -hmm, to do mm -hmm. it? You know, a lot of, um, you know, I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not a medical doctor, so I, I try to stay in my lane. So I, <laughs> you know, I, I don't, I, I read, a, you know, a lot of conflicting things about all sorts of health comes and, you know, social determinants of health and public health. Mm -hmm, but this is what mm -hmm. I do know. When people have the financial resources, when they have the security and stability of housing, when they know that their kids are going to a good school where they're safe, they're able to make the best possible choices. And so I think that it isn't just about the food, it's about all of the stressors in a society that allows injustice mm -hmm. to continue yeah. and benefits from it, that exacerbates the problem. You know, I, I can cook every night because I'm a college professor. I have plenty yeah. of money and I have a giant kitchen and I, if I feel like eating something, I can cook it. The implications, yeah. right? are different for me because of the position I have. Well, everyone should mm. have that ability. Everyone should yeah. have an hour or two to make something if they want it. But, you know, in the communities in which fast food has thrived, I would say that fast food is a sensible choice for people who are constrained with work and responsibilities and don't have the freedom mm -hmm. to have choice and to have a quality of life where things can be equally prioritized. I think that's true. And I, I also think that, that, um, I've had some experiences in the South and other places in underserved communities. And what, what strikes me in, in Cleveland Clinic, where I work, we, we work a lot with the African-American communities around uh, their chronic health issues, around the food issues. And, and you know, one, it, it seems to me there's a couple of things. One is just a lack of awareness and education about the importance of nutrition in terms of determining health outcomes and determining, you know, 
um, your ability to actually function in, in, in life. And two is, is the obviously lack of access. Uh, and, and, and three is just the, the sort of embedded beliefs and experiences that prevent them from actually even knowing what to do. So you're, you're saying you can cook a meal because you know what to do, but you know, if you don't have the education, if you don't have the family background, if you don't have the exposure, you, you don't know what to do with the food. So, you know, and in Cleveland, I, I, I taught a cooking class for 300. We thought a few people would show up. 300 African-American women showed up for this cooking class to make kale smoothies, you know? And I was sort of shocked because I thought, wow, you know, they really, they really have not gotten access to the right information and, and they're just exposed to a food culture that's driving poor choices where the healthy choice is a really hard choice or they're not even aware what the healthy choice is and the, the, the bad choice is the easy choice. I mean, I think that, I think that, that, you know, uh, that the, the individual relationship to food is so complicated. And I think that, Mm -hmm. you know, there's all sorts of influences on what we eat and what we consume. I think that, you know, from my perspective, the, the food is often an indicator. The food that is available to us in our most proximate locations is an indicator of what society has determined is right for us or good for us or what we're allowed to have. And so, you know, I think that there are people who, um, you know, they, they would, they would love an opportunity for food to be something they can engage with in a kind of fullness. Right. You know, I, I talked to a lot of, um, you know, young professionals who are in the space of food justice. And, you know, we talk about things like community gardens, nutrition and, yeah, and cooking yeah. classes and education. And I say, you know, I think all of these are, are great opportunities. I said, but let me ask you this. How many of the people that you're working with, how do you know if they have electricity um, to keep their foods stored in a fresh place? Like, how do you know that they have the heating gas and the cooking gas yeah. that they need yeah. all winter long? And I said, you know, the the information about food, I think, is key. And then we take a step back and say, what are the conditions in, pe- in which people are living and fighting for? You know, I'm, I'm a Midwesterner. When it gets yeah. very cold, the gas company won't cut off your gas. But once the weather gets to 60 degrees, they will. And so if we have people who are in arrears on their utilities, we can tell them to make all sorts of stuff, but we have to make sure that those needs can actually be met. Absolutely. Um, You know, I want to kind of loop back to something you said that I think is pretty important and I don't want to pass over it, which is the idea that, that, you know, that business can solve social problems. Um, and and I, from listening to it, it sounds like you're not a big fan of Adam Smith and the Invisible Hand, <laughs> yeah, trickle down yeah. economics, and and the idea that you know um, we have to look at the the structure of the society that we live in. And you know, I spent a lot of time in Haiti and work with Paul Farmer, and he talks about this concept of structural violence. You know, what are the social, economic, and political conditions that drive disease? We talk now about the social determinants of health. They're they're the primary drivers of chronic disease, and and a lot of that has to do with the issues you're, you're discussing in your book and the disenfranchisement through the franchising of, of all these these uh, fast food restaurants everywhere, and and I think it's a very important point because you know we we have a, a pretty strong cultural view that you know capitalism and innovation and business will solve all of our problems and that and that social problems can be solved through business solutions and you're challenging that orthodoxy. Um, and, and I'd love you to unpack that a little bit because from your perspective, looking into the details of this, what needs to change in terms of our social policies and our government policies that actually can 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 actually change the trajectory of uh, the ill health and the consequences of that health on everything from childhood development to you know economic success and viability and the ability to actually get ahead and get out of the circumstances that people find themselves in? Because I... I, I do think, and, and I do believe, you know, given what I've seen in other research, that that the the ongoing um, sort of um, plight of of underserved communities, uh, whether they're poor white communities or African American communities or Hispanic communities, is really driven off of the um, you know the underlying inability to to actually get good nutrition, and that that food sort of is the center of 
the beginning of building a healthy human who is functional and capable. And I, I'll just give you a quick example of what I mean by that. You know, uh, you know in, in, in juvenile detention centers, when they swap out healthy food for bad food that the kids are eating, there's over a 91% reduction in violence in the juvenile detention centers, a 75% reduction in restraints, 100% reduction in suicides, which affects their behavior. And so people's thoughts, feelings, behaviors, actions, capacity to function is really inhibited by the toxic nutritional landscape that we live in. And, and so I'm curious from your perspective, looking at this and the history of fast food and its intersectionality with racism and civil rights, and how, how do we get out of this? Because, you know, you've done a great job of explaining what happened. How do we sort of move through to what we actually need to do to, to reclaim um, the health of our communities and society? Living wage, free college, free childcare, all right. Medicare for all. <laughs> I mean, I mean yeah. you know, it's it, all of these things, right. Get in the way yeah. of people yeah. being able to take a beat and make wide decisions about their lives. Right. Yeah. So, um, I, you know, I, I don't have very strong positions on, you know, we also have to care about the supply chain because our, mm. I mean, this is also an environmental issue that I don't get into in the book, yes. but you know, if, if I had yeah. endless pages to write, I mean, this is, <laughs> this is, it is incredible to me. And I tell my mm. students this and they, they say, okay, professor Chatlin, we hear this all the time. Um, when I was a kid, you couldn't get food everywhere. And now food is everywhere. There weren't mm. food in, there wasn't food bookstores. There wasn't food everywhere. There wasn't prepared food everywhere. There is a, there was a landscape that, um, that I am troubled by, not just by, you know, kind of our ability to make choices in a, in a, in a varied diet, but someone has to produce and harvest all of this food that we are either consuming or wasting or, you know, um, or, or, or using to transform into chemical products to put back into food. This is not good. And so we should not, I shouldn't be able to get a pineapple at my local grocery right now. It's, it's January, but I can, right? And so all of this is to say that we have to kind of make different choices about investments in people's lives. So, mm -hmm. you know, whether, you know, it could be the corn subsidies or it could be military spending, you know, everything needs to be on the table to say, what are we going to do to improve the quality of people's lives? Because, yeah. you know, food isn't just about fuel. Food is about emotion. Food is about, you know, love and affection. I mean, I, 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 tr yeah. I try to have a very kind of um, nuanced, non-judgmental view of how people use food in their lives. But the reality is, is that food can become a low priority when you are under the stress and under the gun of so many of these other concerns. So once we have a strong social safety net that actually is geared towards caring for people, I think these mm. other issues will slowly um, start to fade in our view because it yeah. isn't just the toxic foods, right? Like it isn't just the things that may make a person ill. It's about the stress that they live under and the inability yeah. to do anything else but consume and work and worry about your livelihood. So, I mean, you know, it's it's expensive, but I think we've seen that the cost of ignoring these issues is also quite expensive. So the question is, on what end are we going to pay? I think you're absolutely right. I mean, it seems like it's a cost driver to do these things, free education, free health care, you know, basic living wage. But I think it's actually a bargain when you look at the downstream benefits of doing these things. The only, the only thing I'd say to challenge this a little bit is that, you know, when you say Medicare for all, health care for all, that only works if, if we can figure out how to stop the population from being so sick. And it speaks to the issue of the supply chain which is all the food that's being produced that's driving this. So 60% of the calories Americans eat are processed food. 67% of the calories that kids eat are ultra processed food. And, and, and that is being produced by a food system that's incentivized by our current policies that really um, prevent the ability to actually choose and get the right food. So if, if, we, if we do, what I worry about with Medicare for all particularly is that, that we're just going to like, create healthcare coverage, and then we're not going to address the reason why people are going into healthcare system in the first place. Uh, and, and we're just going to, we're just going to be crushed. And I think that's sort of the challenge. You have to fix all of it at the same time. I mean, look at food stamps, which is great, you know, safety net, but 
you know, we, we say with the dietary guidelines, stop eating sugar and don't drink your calories and you know, don't eat processed food. And yet 75% of the food stamps are spent on processed food and 10% on soda. So, um, and how do you, how do you, you sort of now? Can you use food assistance on, on soda? I thought there were foods oh that my were, God, yes. were marked as no. such. No, I didn't know no, that. No, no, no. You, you, can, you, can, you cannot buy a rotisserie chicken in the grocery store because it's cooked. But it's you can buy a two food. liter. Yeah. Yes, but you can buy a two liter bottle of soda. But here's the thing. I I don't know if I I don't know if I object to the purchasing of the soda so mm. much as uh because I that probably was the work of some type of lobbyist who was working of for course. the corn industry of course. for the corn of lobby course. right and so I mean I I think that this is again like people can have choices I guess in these markets that's the the, the choice is not what vexes me so much it's the mechanism that makes that makes the call on the choices, right? It's the no household products, but you can, you know, certain foods. It's deciding that, right. you know, ketchup is a vegetable. So when, right. you know, when we're playing with these types of kind of upside down thinking, um, you know, it, it, it really does speak to the heart of the imbalance and influence. And this is why businesses should not be in the in the game of uplifting people's lives. I mean, they should be regulated to the point where they have to participate in a free and fair economy and focus on what they do, right? They make products and we as a society are tasked with taking care of each other. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you look at countries, you know, that, that actually have these strong social safety nets that have healthcare, that have free education, that, you know, provide, you know, economic opportunity their their numbers are dramatically better all across the board in terms of obesity, the health of the population, and and you know and much more. So um, it's pretty it's pretty interesting to see that, and I, I feel like we're, we're we're really afraid in this country of doing anything like that because it speaks of socialism, right? It speaks of of this idea that you know we're all um, you know going to become communists or something. But it really it's it, it really I don't see a way out unless we actually create um a, a a true fair market where the true costs of the food and the food system and everything else are embedded in the price because right now the price you pay at checkout is not the true cost of the food the rockefeller foundation produced a report recently about the true cost of food that showed that basically was uh, basically three times the cost of the actual price that you pay at the checkout counter for the food in terms of its effect on health on the economy on climate on social justice issues and and that's you know a staggering number so actually if if we actually had the food companies accountable for the externalities and that really they're really not externalities they're embedded in the in the very way that we have the food system then you know if we don't do that we're we're really kind of not going to be able to solve the the crisis we have now of chronic disease and obesity and all, uh, and I think which is all linked to to injustice across the board, economic injustice, racial injustice. It's all it's all like one intersecting problem, right? Mm-hmm. And I think you know, I think that it's a shift in 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 focus. I think that what the past fifty years has done is created a space in which the lines between public and private are so blurred that yeah. we actually imagine a world where we go to companies to solve these problems and and we forget that people actually have power. And I think that yeah. one of the reasons why I wanted to write this book was to talk mm. about the fact that none of these things that we see are inevitable. There is a period of time where you know, corporations are grooming people, they're ingratiating themselves, they're finding people at their most desperate moments, and they're capitalizing mm. on that. And so mm. in that process, when we see it happening, perhaps we have the tools to make sure it doesn't, um, that we, we aren't living in the United States of Coca-Cola or McDonald's, <laughs> that we're actually, you know, in our, our position as people who advocate for each other and can actually push back against the corporations. Okay, so um, you know, Marsh, you talked about the ways in which these food companies aren't really held accountable, and they're they're actually influencing our communities in ways that are often invisible. And I think you know, talk about in the book, for example, how McDonald's you know gives money to the NAACP, or you know, you know I know Coca Cola does that, and they fund the King Center in Atlanta, and they they provide a lot of support for 
social programs and they do it as their you know, corporate social responsibility activities. But there's a there's a dark side to it, which actually in in, in, in creates indebtedness in these communities to these food companies that are actually killing them. So it's like, you know, how do you navigate that? And how do you educate the communities to say, hey, you know, um, how do how do how do we sort of thread that needle? Because yes, they need the services and the support. Who else is going to give it to them? The government isn't, right? So they're turning to these, you know, food corporations to actually support their communities. But on the other hand, they're also killing them. Well, I mean, I think that it requires two things. One, I think in trying to engage the conversation about the relationship between corporations and community, the first thing, um, you know, that I hope I did in this book was to come from a place of empathy to say, these are tough choices. If Mm. presented with a million dollars in Mm. order for your organization to achieve its goals, I think it's a really Mm. hard thing to turn down. And what power do we unlock in turning down? What does it mean for us to say, no, we are not comfortable with the way that this money is made and we're going to make a different choice. And I think that, you know, the tough sell isn't just don't take money from this corporate entity, but rather why does this corporate entity have so much power in the first place? Why, if we want to memorialize Dr. King, that we need Coca-Cola to help us do that? Why is it when we need these resources that this is the place where the resources come. And so I think that, you know, this is not about telling people who have constrained choices, you made the wrong choice, but rather to say, okay, how can we create a vision of a world where you're not in this bind anymore? And who do we Mm -hmm. need to talk to? And how do we need to come together to imagine a different way of proceeding in the future? And that requires massive policy change, right? And and policy change in this country is primarily driven by large corporations and huge lobbying budgets. And the food and ag industry, you know, dwarfs all other industries in terms of their lobbying efforts um, and their opposition to any progressive changes in food policies that might promote health or change your agricultural systems or, you know, allows ketchup to be a vegetable and French fries to be a vegetable. <laughs> <laughs> That's just crazy, right? And it, and it's both on the Democrat and Republican side. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, um, we saw in Minnesota, uh, Amy Klobuchar is from Minnesota, and she lobbied for pizza to be a vegetable because Swanson mm-hmm. Pizza is the largest supplier of pizza to schools in America, and that had to be considered a vegetable in order <laughs> in order for it to be served in schools. So that kind of stuff just really is discouraging to me. And I and I and I I just I just you know, other than, you know, figuring out how to get some bunch of billionaires to spend billions of dollars in lobbying to do the right thing, how, how do we get out of this? Because because these these education of the lawmakers is so limited. And I've, I've been working on a campaign called the Food Fix Campaign, which is essentially a an education and advocacy group to educate lawmakers and change policies around exactly these issues that we're talking about. And when we go to talk to them, they're just so unaware and all their education has come from uh, industry and, and not from mm-hmm. real science. Uh, and, and so we're sort of battling this problem. And then we've obviously got the, you know, you've got these lawmakers who are often um, funded in large part by these 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 uh, corporate interests that actually affect their ability to be, have independent thought. <laughs> and I, I, don't, I don't know, I, I don't know other than, you know, really raising up a populace that is, mm-hmm is conscious mm-hmm. and is able to elect leaders who are addressing the issues of how we're going to change this. Well, I mean, I think one of the things that we've seen um, in our electoral process is that if you, that, that grassroots, grassroots intervention is possible, that we have an array of elected officials who have no business serving in Congress, as far as I'm concerned, but they were able to touch a nerve galvanize enough grassroots support and compel their parties to put them forward for good and for bad. And so I think that, you know, in the future, I can imagine a world in which we are running food justice candidates from communities Mm -hmm. that have been um, underserved and harmed by our food system as agricultural workers, as people and processing plants, I think as um, you know, we see what hap- is happening with grocery workers and their vulnerability to COVID. Mm. I think mm. that there is a potential political movement 
based on a broadly defined idea of food justice that isn't just about what we consume, but the conditions under which we consume and who is producing the foods that we consume, I think it could be incredibly powerful. But, you know, this is where we need to kind of put some of our energies as well. I think you're absolutely right. You know, when you look at the, uh, you know, the legacy of racism in this country and slavery, it, it, it was embedded in the Fair Labor Standards Act, which under the New Deal of Roosevelt, uh, set labor standards that provide safe working conditions and a fair wage and, you know, reasonable working hours and vacation and sick leave and all these benefits that we sort of take for granted. The only way he could get that law passed and fight the Southern Dixie Democrats who were all racist was to exclude food and farm workers, which were primarily black. And, and that legacy still continues today. It's why we see tipping in restaurants. It's why we see, you know, farm workers not have the same labor protections as other workers. And it, it perpetuates this whole vicious cycle. So you're right. It's, it's a much bigger problem than just the food people eat in the grocery, from the grocery store or in a fast food restaurant. It's, it's really the whole uh, embedded racism within the entire food supply chain. And I think that this is, you know, um, you know, we're having this conversation on January 6th and, oh, yeah. you know, it, <laughs> there's it, that. It's a, you know, I'm, I'm in a PPS documentary about January 6th that airs later tonight. And, you know, these oh. things are not unrelated, um, mm. you know, and I think that for us to get to a place where we are adequately addressing all of these disparities we also have to be in a place where we are willing to acknowledge um, the persistent and, you know, kind of relentlessness of racism in shaping policy decisions, in framing, um, you know, the ways people live and the ways that they are told they should live or allowed to live. You know, all of this is this is a racial reckoning. We often think of racial reckoning as dramatic events, dramatic confrontations, uprisings. But anytime we have a conversation in America about inequality and we're serious about looking at the history of it and the roots of it, this is a type, this is racial reckoning um, in talking about our food system. And so, you know, I think, uh, the, and at the same time, as many, as, as much as we can point to the many things that are wrong, I think that we can also, you know, be confident in the fact that every day people are growing and learning and they're pushing back and challenging a lot of hegemonic ideas about society, about food, about food production. You know, a, a group of Starbucks workers in, um, you know, in New York were able to unionize their store um, because they're saying no more. I mean, what we're seeing right now with the intersection of COVID, the great resignation, these battles about reopening, this, is, this can be an incredible moment for labor and for raising consciousness about what it really costs, the human toll of our current food system. And I'm incredibly optimistic that as we move toward an understanding of what COVID has done, that we're going to get mm. people who are going to fight for justice in ways that we we had never imagined before. I think that's really true. I think I think there is sort of an awakening. And I think, um, you know, the, the, the Black Lives Matter movement is really important. And I think it raises awareness about just racism in general and, and, and police violence and, and, and gun violence is a real problem, right? It, it, and it's accountable for, you know, 1.3% of all deaths in America, which is real and it, it needs to end. And, and, and we're very aware of it. Uh, you know, we've got, you know, George Floyd, <laughs> I mean, the, 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 you know, uh, we've got so many people who, who really know, um, the names of the people who are, are, have been victims of this, Tamir Rice and so forth. But what we, what we really don't think about is that the food system and the food that we're eating is responsible for 70% of the deaths. So it kills far more people than, than gun violence. And, and yet there's a lack of sort of a framing of the problem as, as a social justice or as a food justice issue. And, and I think you sort of bring that out in your book, but it's, it's, it's to me, it's, it, unless we sort of name it, you know, uh, and call it out, it's like black lives matter, but black health matters too. And I think that that's, we're not going to kind of get to connect the dots for people to go, wow, you know, maybe this is, this is part of the reason why these communities are so burdened and, and, and unable to emerge from 
the conditions in which they live. And, and I, I think, um, you know, I've seen this over and over again, where, where, when you, you look at, you know, when you start to sort of create awareness in these communities, they, there, there's like a, a level of internalized racism around food. Like this is our food. Right. And I, I, you know, I tell a story in my book, Food Fix, about a Native American man, a Hopi chief. I was on a rafting trip with him to raise awareness about the tar sands mining in the Tabacus Plateau in, in Utah and how that would affect the Colorado River Basin and so forth. And we were on, he was very overweight and he was, he was diabetic and he was throwing up on his way down because the exercise just about killed him. And we were in the boat and I said, you know, Howard, you can, you can fix this, you know. And he said, what do I have to do? And he says, well, you know, um, I said, well, you have to sort of cut out all the sugar and the soda and all the starchy foods and the flour and, and you can fix this. He says, oh, wow. He says, I don't know if I can do that. I'm like, why? He says, well, we have our traditional Hopi ceremonies. And I'm like, yeah. And he says, well, we have our traditional Hopi ceremonial foods. I'm like, okay, well, what are those foods? He says, well, cookies, cakes, and pies. You know what I'm like? That was a sort of an eye opening to me because it sort of, it sort of highlighted the fact that in these cultures, there's a lot of identification with the food as being their cultural food. And, and yet, it, I don't think that's distinct to communities of color, though. Uh, no, but, 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 you know, the level, the, the, like, you know, particularly, you know, I think it, it, there has been a, you know, if you look at the history, and I think Leah Penniman talks about this, I don't know if you know her work, but mm -hmm. there, there's yeah. this, has been this sort of evolution of, you know, the African American food um, culture mm -hmm. from slavery to, to the present that has, has sort of led them to believe that these are their foods, right? All the yeah, Southern but I, food I mean, super I'm gonna, healthy. I'm gonna, I'm going to push back on this. I think every group has their food. I mean, <laughs> I know. I mean, I think what I think, I think you're right. Every group has their foods. The question is the opportunity and the desire to vary, to, de, to um, depart from one's foods. Mm -hmm. Right. So, because I think that like, yeah. if, you know, because we have holidays, we have, you know, every group has something that is a celebration food, a special occasion food and sure, everyday sure. food. So, I mean, I, I, I don't think those two ideas are necessarily in opposition, that a person can have a, a varied and complex diet and there can be, you know, a set of foods that, that have value course, and meaning. Of course. Do you want to know my secret for living a long and happy and healthy life? Well, all I have to do is check out my weekly newsletter, Mark's Picks, where I share my favorite tips for health, longevity, well-being, and lots more. Check it out and the link below. But uh, my point is that the Hopi traditional foods is not cookies, cakes, and pies, right? That's not well, what their I ancestors mean, well, were eating 500 years that's, ago. <laughs> but I think this isn't, but I think the, the, the point you make is really interesting because, um, you know, we are in an era with the popularity of like 23andMe and all of this kind of finding your yeah, root yeah. about like what, what we, what we understand is traditionally ours. Right. Yeah. And so, mm -hmm. so yes, I'm sure, you know, within a thousand year frame, what we consider a traditional food is, is radically different than, you know, a, a pie or a cake. But I think, but I think it, that story is really illustrative though, about, this whole conversation we're having, well, pies and cakes are introduced by, right, the forces of colonialism, of yes. processed food coming to reservations, about broken treaties yes. and sovereignty. And mm -hmm. so, you know, so so you can say, well, you know, I, I, I want to think, I want you to think about expanding maybe the variety of foods that, you know, that that you engage with. But, you know, for this guy, that is a traditional food. And I think that that's important. I guess so, but but you know that culture is so oppressed, and it's and to me it's a second genocide. Uh, you know, we we killed them all with guns and <laughs> killed all their food supply, and took away their food sovereignty and gave them food commodities from the government, basically flour, sugar, and trans fats, and and then we we sort of are seeing this massive epidemic of, of disease in this population that's worse than any other in the culture, right? So we see 80% of you know, Native American, like in the Pima Indians, are diabetic by the time they're 30. Their life expectancy is 46. And you know, this is this is really the third world in America. And and I think a lot of it is driven by the 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 the, the loss of food sovereignty and the loss of their traditional foods uh, and their ability to actually, you know, have have the ability to, to grow and create and make the foods that that actually are designed for their their biology. And I think African-Americans the same way. I think there's a food culture 
that that is has been foisted on them by the food industry that that has been internalized and is leading to this massive you know pandemic of chronic disease. It's what we're seeing with COVID. It's what we're seeing we're seeing you know just in general. I mean, you're you're African American. You're you know I think about eighty uh, percent more likely to get di- to diabetes. Four times as likely to have kidney failure. Three and a half times more likely to suffer amputations. You know, I mean, it's it the data is pretty compelling from a medical perspective of how you know, the, 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 the sort of the inequities in our food system are driving a lot of these chronic, chronic health issues and all the downstream consequences that affect people's ability to have, you know, a happy, healthy, vibrant life. Do you think so? Or am I getting, am I missing the mark? <laughs> no, I think, I think that, I think that health disparity, life expectancy, you know, chronic disease is, is absolutely important to think about, but I guess I guess what I what I would what I would offer is mm. on the level of interventions and engagement, right? Where yeah. do you meet people? Yeah. You know, do you That's do you fair. meet people in a do you meet people in a place and saying, well, you know, everything that you're eating is garbage and you enjoy it and that's not going to work. No one wants to no no one wants to hear that. No nor no one no. needs to be treated that way. The question is, what are, you know, what are the opportunities in community, what are the opportunities in family? What are the opportunities in everyday life to create a variety of experiences around food? Because I think mm-hmm. that, and I think that you know, this is about the context we're coming from. You know, as a as a medical professional, you have to get people to change behaviors. Yeah. Um, and and as a historian, my job is to contextualize human behavior, right? To put it in yeah. a in a place yeah. in the setting. And I think that, you know, in the middle of that are are ways for us to kind of think about, um, you know, th- there there are histories, there are histories that are tied to food, that are sources of pride and sources of mm. um, places in which people point to say this is something. Um, this is something I'm proud of, or this is something that is part of a legacy. And I think what I'm reacting to is the possibility that comes in recognizing that even as there is a desire to change that relationship. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, I'm Jewish and certainly some of the stuff that we, (laughs) is not that healthy and, and, but you know, it's part of our cultural tradition and we do it, but on, you know, special holidays, it's not, it's not necessarily an everyday thing. And I think uh, the, the challenge is that we really have to change the structural conditions uh, from a policy level down. And we also have to sort of name the problem. And I think you did a great job of sort of bringing these issues out in your book, Franchise, uh, The Golden Arches in Black America, because uh, very few people in my perspective are talking about this. There are very few people are actually talking about, you know, food racism or food apartheid or or the, the inequity in our food system that's driving uh, and perpetuating, um, inequality across our society. And I think that that's what kind of really drives me to start to think about these things, which is what are, what are the steps we need to take? And you mentioned obviously things like the basic social safety net, healthcare, education, you know, and, and, um, a basic living wage. Uh, but, but those things, you know, th- those things are really challenging to put forth in our current political environment. And I'm, I'm wondering from your perspective, from a historical context, you know, what are the things we can start to do as individuals, as families, as communities, as, as business owners, if we own businesses, as voters and citizens, what can we do to start to move this in the right direction? Because because we, we, from my view, this is just getting worse and worse. We're seeing worsening rates of all these diseases despite the best medical care. And I think it's because we haven't dealt with the fundamental causes, which you elicit I mean, elucidate in your book. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it's it's about changing relationships to systems so that people could actually trust systems and believe that there's something there for them. Um, I was having an interesting mm. conversation with my husband about vaccine um, vaccine hesitancy, and mm. you know, there's there's all sorts of theories about why people don't want to get vaccinated, why they do want to get vaccinated. I mean, mm. there's a lot there, and I'm actually not that interested in that conversation. But he said something that that was interesting. He said, you know, one of the things that um, medical professionals and people from the CDC keep saying is, if you have any questions about um, the vaccine, go talk to your doctor. And I yeah. said, I said, but I said, you know, I said, who has a doctor? I mean, I, I'm a professional in my early 40s. I don't mm. really have a good primary care doctor where if I had a medical concern, I this person is who I trust. Like, 
Occasionally, yeah. I've gotten good doctors here and there. They move, something happens. You know, my dermatologist yeah. I see every six months. But a doctor that I have a good relationship with that I feel yeah. like I, I, I don't know who I don't know who does. And so just yeah. that framing that there are institutions and that there are people you can turn to when you are in a moment of kind of indecision or hesitation, I thought, who is this? F I mean, who is this advice for? Um, you know, I have excellent health care. I don't have that. So who are, you yeah. know, who is this imagined doctor? And so in the same way that, you know, it's like, yeah. you know, who, who do you trust to make important life decisions with? I think yeah. we are a society where we don't have that on so many levels. And so strengthening our institutions, strengthening the care that our institutions provide, I think will transform the ways that people walk into the world. And if they feel like there's actually a human that they can get good information from. And I think it's, so I think it's in all these places, you know, there's something going on with my kid. My kid's teacher might be good this year. The next year, the, the teacher may be checked out or the school might be running really well this year. And then next year, something happens. This, you know, it's, it's the inconsistency. And so what happens is media starts to fill that gap. And depending on what part of the internet you're living on, yeah, it could be yeah. real good or it can be real bad. So I think, yeah. you know, it's, it's about, it's about trying to create trusting structures on the local level within our communities that are down the street that we can actually believe in. And I think it's, yeah. you know, it's a crisis of community in many ways. I think you're right. I mean, I think this is a community issue. And I think it's sort of one of the closing questions that really I, I had for you, which is that, uh, you know, we are, we are, um, in, in a sense, uh, in this unique moment in history where there's an increasing awareness of racism and structural racism and the Black Lives Matter movement. But, but you say in your book that fast food now more than ever before is a battlefield in the fight for racial injustice. So how do you connect the dots on that for us? And, and mm -hmm. how do we, how do we start to bring that into the discourse? Because to me, unless we, unless we name the problem yes. and create awareness of it, we can't solve it. Absolutely. I think the, I think what happened in the same ways that in the 1960s, the fast food industry co-opted the ideas of civil rights to implant themselves as the extension of Dr. King's dreams. We are now in an era because of so many reactive responses to talking about racial injustice that the mm -hmm. racism is now just embedded. It's a it's a hidden part of how the structure operates, the rules that are made, the people who are engaged, the people who are left out. And so I think that, you know, at its most basic level, wherever I am and whoever I'm talking to, I ask people, what do you want for yourself? What yeah, would you want for yeah. yourself? Most people want long life. They want a place to, you know, live. They want opportunities for their family and community. Most people want that. And mm -hmm. so if you can say, if you want that, if someone else wants that, how does that make you feel? And someone's like, oh, I don't care if someone else wants that. Okay, well, how are you going to want that together? Because this idea that we can innovate, we can earn, we can privatize our way out of social problems, it's not going to happen. You know, yeah. trust me, there's been a deep attempt with COVID to try to buy your way out of, you know, this problem. But at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's on everyone. And so I think that, yeah. You know, we have this incredible opportunity, I think, especially with the pandemic, to get people into a place of healing and empathy to say, if this is what you want for yourself, how how do you get it for yourself and how do you get it for your neighbor and your neighbor's neighbor? Mm -hmm. I think that's a beautiful closing thought. I mean, really, we we have to work in community to solve our collective problems. And I think the overemphasis in America on individualism has prevented a lot of the thinking that actually is needed to solve our social issues. Uh, and, and the idea of trickle down economics of the invisible hand of, you know, entrepreneurship and innovation, solving all our problems. It's good for a lot of stuff, but it ain't good for, for things like this, which, you know, really, um, to me, the whole idea of a free market and a free market capitalism as what we have is a joke. We really don't. We have a, a whole bunch of incentives and policies that support uh, corporations to do the wrong thing and people to not be able to access the right thing. And, yeah. and so part of the, the story is how do we sort of make the, the right choice, the healthy choice, the easy choice, the healthy choice and the, the unhealthy choice, the hard choice. <laughs> That's yeah. really the question. And it's, and like you said, it's really embedded in the sort of a much larger context of, of the entire 
um, you know, supply chain of the food system, all the policies and everything else that's embedded in it. And of, and of course, all the other, all the other issues around racism, this is just one sliver of it, but I think it's an important one. And I think my hope is that, that this is going to become more of an awareness within these communities. And then they're going to stand up and go, hell no, like, no, uh, you know, there was, there was a, um, there's a really great, there's a really great book. I don't know if you saw called the uh, join the club by Tina Rosenberg who's a New York times reporter. And essentially mm-hmm. it's about how change happens through the power of community. Yeah. And, you know, she talked about, you know, all across the world where this happens. She talked about, for example, kids where they, they woke up to the fact that the tobacco industry was manipulating them and targeting them through things like Joe Camel. And they created a campaign called Rage Against the Haze. And they actually were anti-smoking where, you know, a lot of kids are kind of into smoking. So how do we create that kind of a movement, yeah. almost like akin to the civil rights movement, that includes this conversation about food. That, that's what I, I'd love to hear you know, your thoughts on that. I think it's happening. I think in small ways, Oakland Food Collective, I think um, DC Greens here in DC, I think it's happening in the small scale. I think that there are groups that, especially again with COVID, are creating mutual aid networks that are thinking about food and, and doing the work. I think it's hard to scale up, but I think that when you have a community where there's multiple models of how people are getting their needs met, you can draw mm. people in to one that is responsive and thoughtful. And, you know, I think that I think that the future has a lot of hope in it because I think mm. that there's a lot of people who are really bringing their creativity and saying that you don't have to do it, um, you know, any one way. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I, I actually feel hopeful. I see, I see a rising tide of consciousness and awareness and conversations and, and in the pockets of innovation, like you mentioned, uh, like here in Washington in New York City and gardens and farms and the Oakland Food Collective you mentioned and many, many other, many other groups that are starting to try to bring this like, uh, like Ron Finley in LA with his, you know, gangster gardener and, you know, urban food forest. So there's, there's definitely things happening that are raising awareness. If you love that last video, you're going to love the next one. Check it out here. You know, in my patients, I'm struck by how motivated people are, how much they want to get better, how uh, much effort they put into doing the thing that uh, will help them be healthier. Mm. And yet 